wondered how one of the most beautiful and powerful angels could have walked away from God? That's Lucifer's story, or as he's also called, Satan. I'm Steve Schwetz, your host on this five-year journey through the Bible, and our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, is going to take us through the infamous demonic fall and then explain how our culture today promotes the very same sinful thinking that led to Satan's eventual demise. But before we get into our study, let's share a few letters from our friends on the Bible bus. First, we've got an inspiring note. This is from Kathy. She lives in San Antonio, Texas. I'm severely disabled due to osteoarthritis in my hands, back, and feet. I've had both knees replaced already and am facing more orthopedic surgery as time goes on and my joints deteriorate. I'm unable to go and tell the nations about Jesus and his love for us, how God sent his son to pay my sin debt, how my slate is marked, paid in full for my sin. Through my support of Through the Bible, I'm able to help send the message out loud and clear all over the world. Praise God. Thank you, Lord, for this honest, loving pastor who provided me with this opportunity to serve. Every day I look forward to our reports from all over the globe so that I can lift other believers up to the King and ask for blessings on this ministry. The Lord is moving, things are happening, and the time is short. You do not realize how much this opportunity means to me. Thank you, Lord God Almighty. Thank you for the World Prayer Team and our prayer team at my church. Oh God, how great thou art. Isn't that a wonderful letter? Thanks so much, Kathy. Thanks for being a part of our team. Next, we've got an email from Chris. I've been on the Bible bus for a few months now and have recently joined the World Prayer Team. What a blessing, and way to go, Chris. I suffered a serious concussion a little over a year ago. As a result, I was unable to read even a short psalm without feeling absolutely terrible. I've been a Christian for several years, and had made a habit of reading God's Word each day. I had listened to Through the Bible from time to time, but not consistently. Since I was unable to physically read the Word each day due to my condition, I decided to jump aboard the Bible bus to listen to Dr. McGee's systematic teaching of the Word. I started in Genesis several months ago and still listen daily. The Lord's been good, and I am now almost completely healed and can read a lot again without any symptoms. Praise God, now I can read His Word and sit on the Bible bus. What a pleasure it is to be part of the World Prayer Team. Thanks for continuing to bring the whole word to the whole world. And how's God using our time in his word in your life? Would you tell us? You can do it by email by simply writing to BibleBus at ttb.org. And you can also send a note to Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109. If you listen in Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1 is the address to write to. Let's give God all the glory as we pray to begin our study. Heavenly Father, thank you for the changes that you bring into our lives as we trust and follow you each day. Bless our time in your word and may our hearts soak up your truth so that your grace overflows into everything that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now we come back here to Isaiah, the 14th chapter, verse 15. And we left off at a very important place because actually we have here the origin of evil and actually the origin of Satan who was the instigator of evil and of sin. And of course, the question has always been how did it originate and actually what is it? Now, Satan didn't go out and get drunk the first time. That's not what he did. He didn't steal anything. The thing that he did can be summed up in one word, and that is, it was pride. That is, an overweening pride, and we want to reduce it down now to the lowest common denominator. What is sin? Anything that is contrary to the will of God. Now, he was created, as we are going to see, an angel of light, for that's what he was. He was the son of the morning, perfect, but he was given a free moral will. He could choose 
what he wanted to choose. Now he was lifted up and lifted up by pride. He then set his will against the will of God. And we saw last time in verses 13 and 14, five I wills of Lucifer. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Now, it wasn't the purpose of Satan to be different from God. He wanted to be like God. He wanted to be God, in other words. And he put his will above the will of God, and any creature that does that puts himself in the place of God. And there are a great many men like that today. Any man that puts his will above the will of God, that man is making himself God. And he takes the place. And that's what sin is today in the human family. All we like sheep have gone astray. How? Well, from the will of God. We've turned everyone to his own way. His own way. Man's way. There are two ways. God's way and man's way. And that's what the Lord Jesus meant when he said, I am the way. No man comes to the Father but by me. Now, friend, you are in God's universe today. You're breathing his air, using his sunshine. He never sends you a bill for heat and light, but he furnishes it. And you're his creature, and you owe him a great deal. And you are to obey him. Now, this is what he says to you. He says that you and I, we are unable to obey him. It's not in man to obey God. It's not in man to walk obedient to God. He has to come to the Lord Jesus Christ as a poor lost sinner away from God. And then there's given to him a new nature. That's what it means to be born again. This is a tremendous passage of Scripture. Now, will you note what follows this? God's going to judge him. And I want to tell you, it's a severe judgment, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Now, you have here the judgment of Satan. And you find out that the Lord Jesus had said that he saw Satan cast like lightning out of heaven. And in the book of Revelation, we see that. And finally, we are going to see that he's cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. And that's prepared for him. He is a creature that set his will against the will of God. Now, God is working out a great plan and a great purpose that's far beyond the thinking of any person down here. And it's not for you and me to question. It's for you and me to trust him because he's prepared to extend to us mercy and grace and love. Now he goes on and gives here the judgment upon this creature that is coming. Now he says here, Babylon was being controlled by Satan. You remember Satan offered the Lord Jesus the kingdoms of this world. Babylon belonged to him, but back of Babylon was Satan, back of the kingdoms of this world. This is a tremendous revelation that we have here. And he says, verse 22, For I will rise up against them, saith the Lord of hosts, and cut off from Babylon the name and remnant son and nephew, saith the Lord. And he says, I will make it a possession for the bittern and pools of water. Now, if you have ever seen the ruins of Babylon or any pictures of it, you can realize how literally... This has been fulfilled, that there it stands over there today. It'll be rebuilt in that valley. It'll be a Babylon again, a place of the world rulership. And you'll hear the Babel of voices again. There'll be the power of Babel against God, lifted against him. And again, God will come down to judge. That'll be the final judgment. You see, that's the reason these great truths have been given to us in the book of Genesis. 
is to let us know what's coming in the future. And he also mentions here in verse 25, the Assyrian, I'll break the Assyrian in my land. And he represents the king that's coming from the north. Now, I want to come down to verse 28. And verse 28, we actually have here the second burden. Babylon was the first, and now the second one. Then the year that King Ahaz died was this burden. Now, it came about because of the death of Ahaz. He'd reigned for 16 years. He was a very evil king. And, of course, the people felt like that he'd be followed by an evil king. And, well, they were delighted that they were getting rid of Ahaz. That is the thing that they're happy about. They're going to get rid of Ahaz. There is the bare possibility of a good king. And by the way, they did get one. We'll see that as we go on into Isaiah. Now he says here in verse 29, Rejoice not thou, whole Palestina, because the rod of him that smote thee is broken. For out of the serpent's root shall come forth a cockatrice, and his fruit shall be a fiery flying serpent. Now, there was a good king. In fact, there to come two more good kings after Ahaz. But very frankly, the worst kings are yet to come. And therefore, they're to understand that just the rule of man will not bring about in the world any improvement. We exchange in this country, and by how gullible we are as a people. We feel like if we change presidents or change parties, and I've done that a couple of times myself, I'm going to make an improvement. I've made no improvement at all, and I'm sure you have the same feeling. And in that day, they thought that things would be all right. Now, rejoice not thou, O Palestine, because though Ahaz is dead, things are not going to get better at all. Now, before the kingdom blessings come, there'll be a severe judgment of God. And he's looking now down into the future when there will come the Antichrist, there will come the great tribulation period. And, well, actually, there are those that believe that this is not so much a burden here. In fact, it's hard to believe that it is, but it is that. Now, the name Palestina is quite interesting. Actually, it refers to those who gave that name to the land. And the ones who gave that name to the land were the Philistines. They had come up the coast out of Egypt, and they had slipped into that land in the early days. They were there when Israel got there, by the way, and apparently were not there in the days of Abraham, because at that time, the Canaanite was then in the land. But by the time they returned, 400 years later, why the Philistine had come into the land. Now, this is a judgment that'll be on him. Now, specifically, we'll find out in Zephaniah and in Zechariah that there were specific prophecies against the Philistine country. Ascalon was in it. And Ashdod was in it, and there were specific prophecies concerning these and the seacoast towns in that area. They were to be destroyed, and that was literally fulfilled. Now, this detailed judgment that's here is really fierce, by the way. Now we come in chapter 15 to the third, and the third burden here, or the third judgment, is the burden of Moab. Now, this is a brief chapter, but actually, we have coming up now three chapters that deal with Moab. Now, that seems very strange, because we only had two chapters for Babylon, and Babylon was the first great world power. And Moab, to us today, seems very small potatoes. We don't feel like they were ever very important. But in Isaiah's day... In fact, in the time of David, 
Why, this was a land that was very important. Not only important, but it was a great kingdom. Now, the background of Moab was simply this. We have here the burden of Moab. And it's a sudden destruction of that land. And they have quite a history, by the way. It goes back to the time of Lot. And they came into existence. Moab was a son of Lot through the incestuous relationship with his eldest daughter. And the illegitimate son of this sordid affair was the father of the Moabites. And these people became the inveterate and persistent enemies of the nation Israel. Balak, their king, hired Balaam the prophet to curse them, for he feared them when they passed through the land of Moab. And then you have a very lovely story. The little book of Ruth is named for a woman who was a woman of Moab. This maiden of Moab was a very wonderful person. I have been in love with Ruth a long time. And uh, Ruth I'm in love with is not only in the book of Ruth, but my wife, that's her name. And David, he was part Moabite, for he came in the line of Boaz and Ruth. In fact, not too far back. And David took his father, when Saul was after him, over into Moab. Why? Well, they were related. They had relatives over there. And these people finally became the enemies of God's children. And who are the modern Moabites? The nation has disappeared. Well, these are people that are very close to being Christian. They almost were persuaded. They're like Felix and Festus, who heard the gospel. But the king said, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. These were not very far from the kingdom, but they didn't quite make it. They were neighbors. Actually, that land today is the land of the Heshemite kingdom of Jordan, and they had Jerusalem in the kingdom. But, of course, in the Six-Day War, Israel took that and moved the border back where it was originally at the Jordan River, and that's where it stands today. Now, the modern Moabite, I think, is easily discovered. He's today in our churches. He parades as a Christian. He's the one that Paul wrote about, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. We're to see that in this chapter and the two chapters that follow that. And then we find that the little book of Jude describes them. Not only did Paul, but Jude described them. He says that these people are ungodly. They pretend to be, but they are actually ungodly. And they're godless sinners, and they're murmurers. They're complainers. They walk after their own lusts. Their mouth speaks great swelling words, having men's person in admiration because of advantage. They flatter you if they think they can get something from you but they drop you the minute that they think they can't get something from you. Moab was a dangerous friend to have, and they were never a trusted ally of the nation Israel. Now, you have here the judgment that's coming. Verse 1, the burden of Moab, because in the night, air of Moab is laid waste, brought to silence, because in the night, Kerr of Moab is laid waste and brought to silence. Now, silently, and in the night, why, Assyria came down, and Assyria destroyed this nation, and in a way that is unbelievable and almost unspeakable. They seem to wipe them off the face of the earth. And you have here in verse 2, certain places mentioned, and I don't think we're acquainted with but one of them. It says he's gone up to Bajit. You see, he's slipping in during the night, and that means house. And apparently this was the temple of Chemosh that was in that land. And then Moab shall howl over Nebo. Well, that's Mount Nebo where Moses came. 
and over Medeba. And these are cities in that land. And we are told here that this was the way that they were to be destroyed. They were ones who profess to know God and yet spent their time in a heathen temple and a pagan god and said they were worshiping the living and true God. Now we're told in verse 3, In their streets they shall gird themselves with sackcloth on the tops of their houses, and in their streets everyone shall howl, weeping abundantly. I know that when I was in Amman, the capital, I never had such a funny feeling because it's a weird sort of a place. It's a very poor land and yet was in that day a very rich land. But today, you feel like the judgment of God is still upon it. And the judgment was so serious that even Isaiah was moved. In verse 5, he says, My heart shall cry out for Moab. His fugitives shall flee unto Zoar, and heifer three years old. And he goes on, They shall raise up a cry of destruction. You see, the heart of the prophet went out in sympathy because of the terror that's come upon them. And in spite of people's sin today, God still loves them, and he will extend mercy if they would but just turn to him. And you have here that follows the detailed description of this, and this is the judgment that did come upon them. It's been literally fulfilled. Now we continue the burden in chapter 16. You have the final overture of mercy offered to Moab as the prophet looks on to the millennium in the first five verses. Send ye the lamb to the ruler of the lamb from Selah to the wilderness under the mount of the daughter of Zion. Now that lamb is to be sent over and offered on the altar in Israel. And that lamb, by virtue of that, speaks of the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And therefore, they were to recognize the God of Israel in this way. They did not do it, however. For it shall be that as a wandering bird cast out of the nest, so the daughters of Moab shall be at the fords of Arnon. I've crossed that little river, not much of a river, but they could not get away from the Assyrians. They took them there. Now it moves on into the future, and you see the last days brought up before us. Verse 5, And in mercy shall the throne be established, and he shall sit upon it in truth in the tabernacle of David. And you remember James mentioned that in the 15th of Acts when he said that the tabernacle of David was fallen down. But after God called out the Gentiles today in the church, then he'd turn again and build again the tabernacle of David. That's what Isaiah's talking about here. Now, I mentioned a moment ago the fact that brought them down was their pride. Verse 6, we have heard of the pride of Moab. He's very proud. You see, trusting his own righteousness, trusting himself, and made a pretense being religious. Oh, how many people today in the church don't even know what it is to come as a lost sinner to Jesus Christ and be saved. Now, I drop on down here to verse 13 of chapter 16. This is the word that the Lord hath spoken concerning Moab since that time. But now the Lord hath spoken, saying, within three years, as the years of a hireling, the glory of Moab shall be contempt. Now, God, when he's dealing with the nations and with Israel, God uses a calendar, but never with the church. Here he says, in three years, they'll be destroyed. Now, friends, it just happened to be they were destroyed by the Assyrians in three years. All of this came to pass. Isn't the time we're spending in Isaiah fascinating? More than just a prophecy from long ago, we're learning some very important lessons that can impact our lives today. Now, before we go, I want to remind you that Through the Bible continues to look for ways in which we can support you as you endeavor to share God's Word with those that you know and love. 
Well, in that pursuit, we want to remind you of a few free resources that we offer at ttb.org, including offering the audio and text versions of the Bible, get this, in more than 1,800 languages. That's through a partnership with some friends and an organization called Faith Comes by Hearing. You can read and listen to the Bible online or download the Bible.is app into your smartphone. To find out more, visit ttb.org forward slash resources and click on the link that says Bible in My Language. And to share Dr. McGee's teaching in more than a 100 languages, visit ttbinmylanguage.com. If you'd like to learn how you can partner with Through the Bible and together reach out to the whole world with God's whole word, call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE or just visit us at ttb.org forward slash give. Now join us tomorrow as our study of prophecy continues right here on Through the Bible. We're so grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners who are being used by God to take the whole word to the whole world.